Exactly 10 years ago, I did my first TEDx talk. It was in Brussels. I talked about the future of healthcare, but I just published my first book, which was called The New Normal. And it described the world where technology, and especially digital, would stop being special and just become absolutely normal. And I remember in those days, I used the analogy of a camera. I said, if you put a camera on a table and you ask people, what is it? The older people will say, that's a digital camera. Whereas the young generation would just say, it's a camera, because they've actually never seen an analog camera in their life. Ten years ago, I still had to explain digital. And this is exactly what happened in the last decade. Digital became absolutely normal. We transitioned into a world where technology has become absolutely normal. We're always connected. We're never offline. And I'm not saying it's always a good thing. There are certainly many negative aspects to deal with. But thank God we had that new normal in the very strange episode of the pandemic of the last couple of quarters. I mean, something that seemed far away and harmless changed all of our lives very profoundly. And in a way, it was some collective displacement. The entire globe was affected by it. And I'm a big sci-fi enthusiast. The whole pandemic episode reminded me very much of one of my favorite sci-fi movies of the last century, The Day the Earth Stood Still. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's absolutely a classic. And what we encountered was not the day, not the week, not the quarter. It was basically the year that the entire Earth stood still. We, we saw things we never experienced in our life. We saw scenes that we never thought we would ever see in our lifetime. And in a way, this collective global displacement was also, I think, a culmination. It was the great 2020 digital stress test. We had to figure out if we could still survive in a world where digital was actually our only option. I mean, look at lockdown with two kids in our house. There was a perfect correlation between my appreciation as a father and the quality of the Wi-Fi signal in our house. If the Wi-Fi was good, I was okay as a dad. But if there was a tiny interruption in their TikTok stream, they openly started to question if I ever got a degree in computer science. And it wasn't just lockdown. In almost every type of exit scenario, we saw that technology was playing an ever-increasing role in our lives. I love this example, a robot dog in a park in Singapore that was patrolling the park to see if people were actually respecting social distancing. Who could have imagined that just a few years ago? Digital has become the absolute new normal. And what is interesting is that digital used to be the cherry on the cake, and now it became the cake. But it would be foolish to think that this is the end state. I think we're actually rapidly approaching a blue pill, red pill moment here. Ever since I wrote the book, people have been asking me, what's the new, new normal? What's the next new normal? But at the same time, I met a lot of people who actually are homesick for the old normal. And especially now, as we transition into a new era, you have people who really long for the old. But I honestly believe this is probably something that is going to be with us for some time. And the most important is maybe the old normal just doesn't exist anymore. And that's what I fundamentally believe. We're entering a world with a lot of uncertainty, with potentially even more disruption in the last 10 years. And I get excited by that because I fundamentally believe that we're going to be experiencing a world with more and more seismic shocks. Some of these seismic shocks are certainly still going to be technological in nature. It's not because digital is done that it's over. We're going to see advances in technology in the next 10 years that are probably going to blow our minds. It's the combination, the cocktail of these technologies that will be a constant source of seismic shocks. But that's not it. We're now in the middle of a biological seismic shock that is far from over. But look at the big concern that we had before COVID. It was the environment. It was our planet. Think about ecological seismic shocks. This is a wonderful illustration. This is a scene from Blade Runner 2049. Look at the orange sky. But this is San Francisco just after the forest fires of last year. We saw a very interesting case very recently with Texas freezing over with a total collapse of the power grid with huge economic and personal um, impact. And I think this shows that these types of you know, impacts have to be taken very seriously. And remember the public discontent we had around the environment. That public discontent in itself is a powerful force. Maybe we have to prepare for even more social seismic shocks as we enter this next decade. We saw a very interesting case of that just very recently in the US. Even the bigger picture, when you look at the geopolitical landscape, what we're seeing is that the rising tensions around the world are escalating. 
And what used to be a trade war is now a full-blown technology cold war. Conclusion, it's very simple. The world isn't getting more orderly, it's getting more disorderly. A lot of uncertainty, but we shouldn't be afraid of that. As a matter of fact, every single one of those seismic shocks are opportunities because they set things in motion, they trigger things, they create systemic shifts. Look at consumer behavior. This was greatly altered as a result of digital becoming normal. We now know more about the consumer than ever before. We can analyze, we can predict. And then COVID came along and just accelerated the acceleration in consumer behavior. Same thing for work dynamics that just basically shifted overnight. But more fundamentally, as time moves on, we're going to see enormous amount of volatility in operating models and business models, how companies make money. We're going to see enormous volatility when it comes to capacity and resources, and probably enormous upswings even in financial performance. So these seismic shocks, they trigger things, they're going to set even more disruption in motion, and it will be incredibly naive to hope that we're going to go back to a time of stability. As a matter of fact, we're going to see a world in constant change where little things can have huge global consequences overnight. That's what I call the never normal. And I get excited by that. The last couple of years, it was fashionable to talk about these four words, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And maybe you don't like these four words, but they are a really good characteristic of that never normal. As a matter of fact, I think it would be incredibly naive to think that we're going to go back to a time of stability and certainty and simplicity and clarity. On the contrary. This is not one of my favorite people in the world, but he said it brilliantly. We're going to have more and more unknown unknowns. And how do we prepare ourselves for that? That never normal is an incredibly exciting backdrop. We're going to see more fluidity than ever before in business, in society, in economy. We're going to need to adapt, and I think Hawking nailed it when he said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. It's not just fluidity, nobody seems to be staying in their lane anymore. It's very foolish to actually just keep swimming in your own swimming lane. You're going to have to look left and right for opportunities. It's not just fluidity or nonlinear behavior. We see that we don't live in a digital age. We live in a hyper-connected society where everything is connected to everything. And the result of that is that business is moving faster than ever before. We see an acceleration of the acceleration of the pace of change. And that means winners and losers. It is, as Dickens said, truly the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. So if you look at that never normal, a world of fluidity, nonlinear behavior, hyperconnectedness, and that ultra speed, how do we respond to that? And most important, how do we prepare for that? And then it's very telling that in a TEDx KU Leuven talk, where we are basically in one of the oldest universities in the world, that we make a reflection, what is that going to mean for education? How do we apply that idea of liquid, superfluid, nonlinear, hyperconnected, and ultra speed to the world of education, which seems to be one of the most slowing moving parts in society? How do we prepare a next generation for more uncertainty? And I think here we have to make a very clear distinction between, on the one hand, robustness, which is the ability to keep operating even if things are really difficult. But more important is to actually help a next generation to be resilient, to bounce back, and maybe even to bounce forward, to really take advantage of the opportunities that lie in that never normal. And this is where I get really excited, because I think we have a chance. I think we have a shot to really not just think about dealing with these changes and these shocks, but actually using them to our advantage, to creating a society that is going to be more resilient. Now, make no mistake, it's going to be a roller coaster ride. I'm a technologist by training. I love change and innovation. But I think the next decade is spectacular. We're going to see more technology disruption than ever before. We're going to see more changes in markets and consumer behavior. We're going to see more volatility in market dynamics than ever before. And we're going to see enormous changes when it comes to operating models in economies around the world. How do we prepare for that? And how do we prepare our education system to actually accelerate to move at the speed of the change of the never normal? How do we instruct that resilience into the very core of how we educate the next generations? I think the number one thing in that roller coaster ride is to marry that idea of the human being, 
to marry the concept of the individual with that change. Because we clearly see that that individual, over the lifetime of you know, their basic um, opportunities, is going to see more changes in their career than ever before. I get excited by this, but it means that we're going to constantly have to reinvent ourselves. Reinvent ourselves as institutions, as companies, as organizations, but also as individuals. And there's one central theme that has been running through my work. It's a concept of the day after tomorrow. The day after tomorrow is a very, very simple model, and it's a reflection. How much time do we spend on today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow? What's today? Well, in these days, it's the hundreds of emails we get. It's the dozens of Zoom calls and team meetings we're in. What is tomorrow? It's the classic way that we actually think about the future. And then there's the day after tomorrow. New ideas, new concepts, new business models, new opportunities. How much time do we actually spend to think about that day after tomorrow? If you look at those three, today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, many people tell me, oh, it's 70, 20, 10. But the reality for most of us is 93, 7, and 0 when it comes to time. And the problem and the challenge is value. Of course today is important. And tomorrow is even more important. But that day after tomorrow becomes absolutely crucial if we want to reinvent ourselves. Unfortunately, that's not the full model. Um, as I've witnessed over and over again, many organizations, many companies, even have that big red square, which is the shit of yesterday, which creates negative energy. And companies need to rebalance that. They need to focus more on the day after tomorrow and less on cleaning up the mess of the past. But think about the world of education. How are we dragging that legacy with us and how are we really transforming for that day after tomorrow? This is probably one of my favorite paintings in the world. This is La Clairvoyance by Magritte. Magritte is a famous Belgian surrealist painter. And I think it is incredibly difficult to interpret that egg and figure out what that day after tomorrow bird is going to be. But I think this is exactly what we need to do right now for education. The opportunities are here. A classic mistake we made in the last 10 years is when digital became normal is that we thought, it's about digital, it's about technology, it's about infrastructure. But no, it's not about just putting laptops in schools. Of course, technology is going to help. I love this Chinese example where you, know, you see technology that could be used to measure if students are actually paying attention. You can see who's falling asleep and who's actually really still in tune with what is being taught. But that's not it. That is core infrastructure, and that is just the beginning. The real gap is between the infrastructure and the reality of really rethinking what we want to convey as a message. If we want to really prepare a next generation for that never normal day after tomorrow, we're going to have to do more than just build digital infrastructure. And I think this is where the real reset comes in. This is a reset opportunity for the world of education. And I call this oil rigs, prisons, and schools. And the reason I call it that is because I come from the DVD generation. I still remember putting a DVD in my DVD player. And every time in those days when I put a physical DVD in a DVD player, I had a warning message. And the warning message, like this one, would say that I was not allowed to play that content in oil rigs, prisons, and schools. And in hindsight, it was very interesting that the media industry realized that schools were often in the same category as prisons and oil rigs. That's what we have to overcome. And the reason is very simple. I mean, education is absolutely essential. No discussion there. But how can we reinvent education to be even more relevant for the next generation, even more relevant for that never normal? In a world where students that are you know, now in education are probably going to have a 100-year life, they will have to reinvent their career probably six or seven times during their entire course. Why do we still teach the same subjects as I had when I was in school? Shouldn't we tabula rasa, maybe even rethink all the subjects that are necessary to deal with that never normal? I love this illustration from the 13th century in one of the earliest universities. And of course, if you look at that, you can only feel sorry for that guy in the corner who is bored out of his skull. I honestly believe that this is the time to fundamentally rethink the foundations, where we stimulate not just the content, but the right side of the brain, where we inspire people to actually think about the day after tomorrow. And let's be honest, content is now ubiquitous. Access to information 
isn't the problem anymore. That is basically solved. But the big transition we need to do is to really change education from a schooling mentality into a learning mentality, where it's not just about content, but about experience, where we inspire people to actually explore the never normal, and where we actually stimulate the creativity and passion that goes along. This is a world in flux. So maybe if we're not going to generate the same type of flux in education, we're not going to make it. The three important elements that we need to do in education are around skills, minds, and hearts. And skills, no discussion there. I mean, the world is changing so quickly with so many technologies that are on our radar screen, we're going to have to reinvent the skill set. And the reskilling is going to be one of the top priorities of every educational institution. But more important than just skills is the mindset. How do we stimulate a next generation of students to actually use that clairvoyance? How do we stimulate a next generation to be passionately curious about the day after tomorrow, to be endlessly open-minded, to explore that never normal? How do we stimulate them to be forcefully resilient and vigorously creative? And the final element is the heart set. I mean, the engagement necessary to tackle these huge challenges of the never normal is significant. And we're going to have to figure out how we can actually take that, not just to the individual, but to the collective. It's about skills, minds, and hearts. I think that's the only way to reinvent the world of education. The most important thing is going to be the psychological safety, to try to experiment, even if you could fail. I from Mandela, I never fail. I either win or I learn. Unfortunately, for students that are watching, this is no longer the time where you can wait for the final Harvard Business Review article and implement seven steps. It's no longer about lessons learned. It's about lessons learning. We will have to figure it out as we go along. That psychological safety has to be at the very heart of how we educate the next generation for the never normal. Because we will not have to be schooled. We will have to be trained to learn and learn our entire lives. This is the uncertainty that is part of the never normal. But I love what Alvin Toffler said. The illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. That is what we need to be inspired by. And I'm sure there are still plenty of people out there who don't see that, who are afraid of that never normal, and who see only obstacles. But I am the perennial optimist. But I know one thing. We will have to turn this all the way to 11. Skills, minds, and hearts. Let me end with my favorite quote from Maya Angelou. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how truly amazing you can be. I wish you the very luck in reinventing the world of education for the never normal.